Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin tonight with what's happening along the Texas-Mexico border. All day long, elected leaders giving their assessments of that situation and what solutions they think are necessary. And we're going to start with Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who gave an update today on the state's Operation Lone Star. The governor introduced the effort just about a month ago as a way to crack down on migrants crossing into Texas. Here's some of what the governor had to say. Operation Lone Star is doing everything they can to keep our community safe. But this problem is not going to be fixed until the Biden administration does its job to secure our border and to get this crisis under control. Operation Lone Star launching 28 days ago, and according to Governor Abbott, there have been nearly 600 criminal arrests, more than 16,000 referrals to Border Patrol, along with seizing 14 pounds of cocaine, 23 firearms, and millions of dollars. Meanwhile, Congressman Henry Cuellar visiting the border today to better assess the current situation as more and more children and adults cross into, the, into our country. Many of them are heading to already overcrowded facilities. Cuellar took a helicopter and boat tour of the U.S.-Mexico border along with Border Patrol. He also visited a place called the Holding Institute, a nonprofit community center in Laredo, where he spoke directly with migrant families. Cuellar says he believes the U.S. needs to work together with Central America to find a solution to the dramatic increase in migrant crossings. But at the same time, we've got to ask those countries to make sure that they don't allow the folks to come over here and apply over there. We work with those Central Americans. We work with um, uh, with uh, Mexico also. The congressman also visited the World Trade Bridge to meet with local and federal officials to discuss cross-border international trade. Meanwhile, Senator John Cornyn visiting the San Antonio Food Bank today, and while there, he also discussed the migrants coming into Texas. Cornyn says he's pushing for judicial hearings to come up with the best solution for what's playing out on the border. I think it's really important to help inform all of members of Congress, the best way to do that other than an in-person visit is through holding hearings and inviting people on both sides of the argument to come in and make their case. San Antonio City Manager Eric Walsh saying today that a contractor hired by the federal government to provide services for the migrant teens being housed at the Freeman Coliseum Expo Hall was not prepared for their arrival. He made those comments during the city council meeting today. The 500 unaccompanied minors arrived at Freeman Coliseum on Monday. It was on that day, according to Walsh, that around 80 Head Start employees worked to help the teen boys. Employees who uh, began working over there in two different shifts uh, in order to allow the, the contractor time to ramp up. There are a number of volunteer organizations who are also helping over there as of uh, 8 a.m. this morning. Um, they have taken over that operation and our employees uh, are not there anymore. The Department of Health and Human Services contracted with Bear County to provide 2,400 beds for the migrant teens at Freeman. Walsh says the Joint Base San Antonio Lackland is expecting to house up to 200 unaccompanied minors next week. And we are going to continue to follow the stories of the migrants at the border and here in South Texas to see our past coverage. You can find it all right there at ksat.com slash border. City Hall, meanwhile, turning its attention to the state capitol today for a staff briefing on the ongoing legislative session. Council members found reason to worry. Some bills could undercut the city's operations. Others could undercut your right to vote. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger brings us the details. Thank you, Jeff, for delivering all this bad news. Today's briefing left at least some council members fretting about what's happening in Austin, like the Senate's passage of Senate Bill 7 early this morning that would add restrictions to some election rules, like polling hours. It just seems like it's really out to get the working class. Then there was a series of bills staff say could negatively impact the city government. If it undermines the city council's ability to make decisions, if it, uh, if it um, takes away our, our local authority, if it adds cost to us, uh, and otherwise uh, undermines our ability to self-govern. Like keeping the city from hiring lobbyists to forbidding the city from reducing its own police budget. It's almost like the, the state is trying to make us powerless to do the things that the people in our communities ask us to do. Though District 10's Clayton Perry noted he hears complaints about every level of government. 
and officials can get voted out if they're not representing their constituents well. We got to remember that it is a representative government. Though not everyone buys that argument. Our government remains a representative government when our government doesn't try to suppress the vote. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The one and only Little Joe of Little Joey La Familia, one of several performers urging their fans to stay safe and get vaccinated against COVID-19. The public service announcements are part of a campaign by Metro Health to reach especially vulnerable minority communities. The founders of the famed Mariachi's Campanas de America, Juan Ortiz, sings from experience. He's a COVID survivor. For him, it was an eight month battle. Like Ortiz, urban pop artist Simply Rain says that she didn't hesitate when Metro Health asked her to help get more people vaccinated and urge them to stay safe. I think sharing this important message through music um, is such a great way to do it. So I was on board completely. If you'd like to check out more of these Metro Health PSAs, we have them all on our website at ksat.com. And today is the start of Child Abuse Awareness Month, and child abuse advocates wasting no time sounding the alarm. Ursula Perry shows us the latest stats point to the fact that the COVID pandemic has been devastating for children at risk of abuse and neglect. Drilling down on the COVID pandemic year numbers is enough to make you sick. Child abuse and neglect numbers rose 18% in 2020 compared to 2019 in Bear County, according to the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. And the number of children killed in those homes also doubled as well. But uh, if you take San Antonio, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, San Antonio has the highest number of child abuse cases in the state and one of the highest in the country. Attacking the issue head on, Harvey Najem. He's put a million dollars toward the purchase of this new headquarters to train CASA advocates. The people who will help with this huge influx of at-risk kids get through the courts and into a safer situation. With COVID and the families staying inside more child abuse has risen so this gift is real it will really impact the service that casa provides for these children to illustrate how big an impact the old casa office could only train 30 volunteers per advocate class the new one can train 100 at a time more advocates trained more at-risk kids getting advocates and now instead of renting a place for all of that work casa will own it it's a beautiful setting for the children, gives them plenty of room to grow. And I think CASA does just such an incredible job with these kids. This new setting can serve 100% of the children who are going through the court system through CASA. That's something that the O facility was far too small to do, but there's still $420,000 to raise. They're hoping to close on the new building November 1st. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. A grand jury indictment alleging intoxication manslaughter was issued today in a 2019 traffic crash on I-10 near Leon Springs. 30-year-old Natalie Suzanne Saldana arrested following that crash on December 22nd of 2019. She was initially charged with intoxication assaults, but those charges later upgraded to intoxication manslaughter after 36-year-old Fred Joliemi died from his injuries. Saldana is accused of driving drunk when she crashed into the man's parked car alongside the highway. The victim and his family were passing through San Antonio, headed to California. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office is yet to identify the 31-year-old motorcyclist killed in a crash this morning. It happened about 2.30 a.m. on Northampton Drive, not far from I-10 in Vance Jackson. Police say the man lost control on a curve, hitting mailboxes in a tree, eventually crashing into a home. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Police believe he was speeding. Look outside with live cam this evening. This was a day I hated to spend inside. It was beautiful out there, Adam. I was wondering where you're going with that. You said this is a day I hated. <laughs> Are you okay there, Myra? What's going on? Yeah, it's such a beautiful day. Uh, gorgeous outside today. Comfortable as well. And you know, we're going to be begging for these days in just a couple of weeks when we start to see the warmth creep back into town. Aquifer. 
down over half a foot today. Now we're 10 and a half feet below the average. As for the pollen count, oak is high at 3,700 and a bunch of other stuff in the air. I mean, we got mold, juniper, mulberry, pine grass, hackberry, all low. Hello spring, right? We started the day at 50 degrees. That's here in San Antonio. The hill country was down in the mid 30s. Then we topped out at 71. Right now, for the most part, we're near the 70 degree mark. Comfort, you're 69, 67 in Canyon Lake, Pleasanton 72 in Hondo at 70. Comfortable this evening, but temperatures falling off pretty quickly. We'll be down in the 50s by 10 p.m. And tomorrow morning, we're gonna start the day in the mid 40s. So partly cloudy, 46 in the morning. So a bit of a chill in the air early, then making it up to 72 for the afternoon high temperature. We'll be back to talk about the Easter weekend and a little disturbance that's going to affect us coming right up. After a year of changes and disruptions the pandemic has brought along, the senior class of this high school will get to experience their well-deserved pomp and circumstance. What graduations will look like for local school districts tonight on The Night. You might have noticed this week that the briefings led by the city and the county focused on COVID-19. They are no longer daily. They have moved to twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays, really focusing on the effort to get our community vaccinated. Yeah, and just giving us the numbers and a continued update on hopefully getting more vaccines because right now the demand is outstripping the supply. Let's go live now to City Hall and Mayor Ron Nuremberg. For the San Antonio community. We are celebrating a vaccination milestone tonight as we have surpassed 500,000 people in Bear County with at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. To be exact, as of yesterday's report, which now includes data from the VA, we have 524,642 people with at least one dose received and a full 294,158 people are fully vaccinated in our community. Yesterday, I want to update you, my council colleagues and I voted in favor of establishing a pilot program for a community-wide wait list for a COVID-19 vaccination registration for individuals 65 or older. City staff are working on developing this central wait list, which will allow individuals to provide their contact information to vaccine providers. Staff expects to launch this effort within a couple of weeks. In the meantime, remember you can subscribe for vaccine alerts by texting uh, vaccine or vacuna to 55000. As a reminder, uh, Metro Health still has some COVID-19 vaccine appointments reserved for those who do not have access to the internet. If you do not have access to the internet, you can book your appointment by phone or by calling, or excuse me, by calling 311 and hitting option 8. The 311 hotline operator the hotline operating hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Tonight we are reporting uh, in the COVID um, uh, infections, uh, we have 249 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 205,777. Our seven-day rolling average is now 190. Unfortunately, uh, we are reporting two more deaths from COVID in our community this evening. Please keep your fr their friends and family in your thoughts this evening. We have lost far too many people in our community from this disease, and we want to remember them. Uh, each and every one of these numbers is a loved one who we've lost, so please keep them in your prayers this evening. There are 185 COVID patients in the hospital this evening, and there have been, over the last 24 hours, 28 new admissions. 74 patients are in the ICU, and 32 are on ventilators. Let me turn it over to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And, and as you mentioned, great news with respect to vaccinations in our community. I think the other good news, um, not just that folks are getting the, the shot, but that we're seeing an increase in the number of doses. I know we've all been waiting patiently about uh, getting vaccinated. I talked to uh, the university health system earlier today. They normally get somewhere around 13,000 doses per week. Uh, next week, they're getting close to 20,000. So over a 50% increase in the number of doses available uh, for next week, at least. We don't know if that's sustainable. It's, it's kind of week by week, but we do know that uh, next week, uh, their dose amount will go up from about 13,000 to about 20,000 available. So some good news coming, uh, some additional slots will be available through University Health. Um, that announcement will be coming soon. Uh, in addition, uh, an, an east side location at St. Phillips will be announced. Um, there should be about 5,000 uh, slots available later in the week, next week. So again, we're going into next week, uh, but some good news with respect to 
uh, the availability of doses. We know that uh, folks are waiting patiently, and, and so that's the good news. Um, just, a, just a quick word of warning as we go into a long holiday weekend. Uh, I know, Mayor, you, you've been talking about this as well, and the numbers bear it out. When you look back at um, the major holiday events going back 12, 13 months ago um, to Memorial Day, Independence Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, now we're going, coming up on Easter, um, that there's a two or three week uh, lag, but two or three weeks later, uh, we show a significant uh, spike and we wanna prevent that. Um, I know a lot of folks are feeling a lot more comfortable because people are getting vaccinated, but we need to keep our guard up this holiday weekend. No large gatherings. If you can stay outside, I know everybody's anxious to get together for, for Easter weekend, uh, but again, uh, we're, getting, we're making significant progress. And I think uh, the only thing that can thwart that prog progress is if we let our guard down uh, so please be careful this weekend. Continue to mask up and have a great, safe holiday weekend. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, and as always, we are now featuring questions frequently asked to Metro Health, uh, which we get to pose to our doctors right here on the air. So I'm going to ask the next question uh, to Dr. Kurian, and that is, how do I know if my side effects are normal or if I should alert my doctor or health care provider after getting a vaccine? So typically after getting a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, it's normal to see um, to have pain and induration around the uh, vaccination site, uh, around the injection site. Uh, you may have low-grade fever, headache, um, generalized weakness. Uh, but if you if you experience symptoms outside of this, and especially it's symptoms like uh, uh, chest congestion or difficulty breathing, you may want to um, seek medical attention promptly. And, and most of these symptoms should subside within 24 to 48 hours after you receive the dose. All right, that's our update from City Hall with the uh, city and county giving us a good update on vaccines. Vaccinations so far, we have passed half a million. 524,642 people have received at least one dose. 294,158 people are fully vaccinated in our community. We've been hearing a lot of questions about why does San Antonio not have a wait list yeah. for vaccinations. Somewhat of a step in that direction yesterday. The mayor a small talked, step. A small step. A step. The yeah. mayor talked about that, uh, which we, of course, covered yesterday, but he mentioned it here tonight. The pilot program not going to launch for a couple of weeks, though, uh, and favors people 65 and older. We have information on our website about that. But we did hear uh, Commissioner Justin Rodriguez there talk about how University Health is going to be upping the dosages they have available next week from 13,000 to 20,000 available. So stay tuned for when appointments may open up for UHS. Yeah, also some exciting news that St. Phillips College is going to be a vaccination site will be announced shortly once they start getting vaccinations. So that's a good news for people who live on the near east side. A great place to get vaccinated uh, in in that part of our community. And, uh, you know, again, the numbers are low. Our seven day average still below 200 people uh, at 190. And unfortunately, there were two new deaths reported today. Uh, let's switch over to weather right now and talk about the fact that a lot of people looking at a long weekend. What's the weather going to be like, Adam? What we had today is just unfortunately not going to stretch into the weekend. We're going to see some changes. It's all because of an upper level system that's headed our way. So let's get to it with the maps here and we're going to head west of Texas. Well, first we'll go east, actually show you where the action is and even some late season snow throughout the Great Lakes and New England. That's where the moisture is, but also a little bit of moisture coming on shore from the Pacific. That's where our next disturbance is just uh, basically offshore from Los Angeles and Southern California. Not a very strong system and it's going to be unorganized once it makes it here this weekend. It'll be enough to basically provide us with plenty of low clouds and make it look like it could rain basically at any moment. But unfortunately, we don't think we're going to get a lot of rain from this. So let's go with our future cast here. 8 a.m. Saturday, low clouds in place and a few hit or miss light showers, basically sprinkles here and there. That should be the case off and on throughout Saturday. I still think you'll be able to go outside and get some yard work done or just if you have outdoor plans, you should generally be OK. Just watch out for some quick, brief sprinkles periodically and whatever does fall, unfortunately, probably won't add up to much. A few hundredths of an inch here and there into Sunday morning, Easter morning, still some low clouds and a little bit of dampness, but in the form of drizzle, 
along with some isolated sprinkles. So some periodic dampness through the weekend is probably the best way to put it. Tomorrow a dry day, actually a beautiful day. A little cool in the morning, long sleeves at 46, and then by noon we're in the 60s. High temperature in the low 70s, partly cloudy, low humidity, very pleasant. You get into the weekend, plenty of low cloud cover with high temperatures at least comfortable right near the 70 degree mark, but we're still running below average until we get into next week. The humidity returns on Tuesday. It's going to be a muggy day at that point. 83 degrees for the high temperature and then look at this. By this time next week, we could be talking Right near 90 degrees. We'll be Ooh. flirting with the 90 degree mark again. Days like today didn't last very long. 90 degrees. Not this already. time of year, Myra. They don't last long at all. Yikes. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. I know his name is Drew Eubanks. I just like to call him Drew Banks. <laughs> is that all right? I, I like it. Okay. Yeah, we'll all run right. it by him and see what I'll, he thinks. I'll see too. what Drew thinks because yeah. he's a big guy. I don't want to, you know, upset him. <laughs> <laughs> Drew Eubanks or Drew Banks is an energy provider off the bench for the Spurs. And uh, DeMar DeRozan has a great way of explaining how he looks when he's playing. And Kiana Williams' parents are great hosts coming up. Goes up tonight at the AT&T Center. It will mark the Spurs' third game in four nights. They won't have a three-day break in between games for the rest of the regular season. Now the Spurs beat the Kings 120 to 106 last night to split the two-game series at the AT&T Center. Patty Mills said sweeping a two-game set isn't easy, as the Kings found out. Seven Spurs scored in double digits last night, including all five starters plus Mills and Rudy Gay off the bench. Andrew Eubanks provided eight points, five boards, and five fouls off the bench. Demar says he's fun to watch. It's entertaining when, when Drew get out there. Um, I know he's gonna go out there and play a string yard. Um, he just remind me of, of a guy like he out there writing a mechanical bull or something. <laughs> <laughs> he, he trying to make something happen, you know, um, and he do, you know. Um, so it's fun when he, when he get out there, he just bring a lot of energy. Spurs and Hawks will play tonight at 7.30. Lonnie Walker the fourth, Trey Lyles, Gorgie Zhang, and Keita bates Diop are all out with injuries. Now Atlanta comes to town after losing to the Suns 117 to 100 Monday night. They've lost two straight and four of the last five. This after an eight-game winning streak that pushed them as high as fifth in the Eastern Conference. The Hawks are 9-4 and four under interim head coach Nate McMillan, who took over March 1st after Lloyd Pierce was relieved of his duties. Tonight is game six of the Hawks' eight-game road trip. The hardest is, is a tough word. I mean, it's definitely a long road trip. Uh, it's definitely tough. Um, uh, definitely just especially being locked up in a room. I can't really do too much. And it's like, uh, it's definitely an adjustment. Um, so, um, I mean, it's tough, but we're all going through it. Um, we're, we're just trying to get through it together and try to just finish out these last two games strong and then um, get ready to just playing some of our Hawks fans. In men's college basketball, Texas hired Texas Tech's Chris Beard to the same position for the Longhorns. He will succeed Shaka Smart, who recently left UT to take over the Marquette job. Beard is a University of Texas alumnus, and the move comes on the same day. His buyout to go to another Big 12 school dropped from $5 million to $4 million. Andy Katz reported around noon today that Beard met with some of his Tech players in person and others via Zoom this morning before leaving for Austin. North Carolina announced today that Hall of Fame basketball coach Roy Williams is retiring after a 33-year career. That includes three national championships, all with the Tar Heels. The decision comes two weeks after the 70-year-old Williams closed his 18th season with the Tar Heels after a highly successful run at Kansas. And Stanford guard Keanu Williams loves being back home for the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Stanford is in the the final four. She was named most outstanding player of the Alamo region and she's playing in front of her family and a lot of friends. Plus, her Stanford teammates are loving her parents, Lachelle and Michael, who are doing a great job at hosting. I think it was last weekend, my, my dad barbecued for, for all the teammates, uh, for all my teammates' parents, uh, that all the parents that came down for the Sweet 16. And actually today at five, they're gonna be down uh, downtown at the Riverwalk. Uh, he rented out a few boats for everyone. So, yeah, he's, he's been playing host, cooking for everyone and, you know, making sure, you know, no one needs anything because, um, you know, we're, we're in our city. So uh, whatever they need, my, my, my parents have it covered. 
Final four tomorrow at the Dome, South Carolina and Stanford at 5 p.m., followed by Arizona and UConn at 8.30 p.m. Sounds like he's uh, spoiling the Stanford <laughs> Cardinal. It is right li it's literally home cooking it is for indeed. the Stanford Cardinal. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. Every week, we take your biggest COVID-19 questions straight to our local expert, Dr. Ruth Bergren, infectious disease doctor with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, good to see you. Thanks, as always, for being here. Uh, let's start with the question we continue to get over and over again. What happens or what should someone do if they end up getting COVID-19 in, in between a first and second dose of the vaccine? So thank you for the question. I have had this happen to several of my own patients, and I've reviewed this um, game plan uh, with guidelines that are online and with my infectious disease colleagues. So here's the deal. Um, after When you get COVID, you should not go and get your vaccine while you're sick. So if you're actually sick with COVID and it's time for your second shot, please don't go and get it. You have to complete your 10 days of isolation and the 24 hours of no fever with no fever lowering medicine. Once that time has completed, uh, you can go and get your second shot and it's possible that you'll still be on time for your second shot. You may wait up to 90 days after having COVID to go and get your second shot. Some people will be getting the monoclonal antibody treatment because they have symptoms and because they're over the age of 55 or they have some kind of condition that puts them at high risk for a bad outcome. So if you had your first COVID shot, then you get sick and you have a underlying condition or you're over 55, you should probably get the monoclonal antibody infusion. After that monoclonal in antibody infusion, you will have to wait 90 days before you can get your second shot because the second shot won't take if because of the antibodies that you were given. I want to move on to another question. You know, there were a lot of concerns and still a lot of concerns about people making sure they get the vaccine. There are some people afraid of getting the vaccine, but now we're hearing kind of the opposite end of that, that some people are going in and getting third doses instead of the re recommended two doses. Talk a little bit about that and and why people may be doing that and why it's not a good idea. Right. So um, some folks have gone off to get an antibody test after their vaccine to see whether their vaccine took or not. And that is not a good idea because we have many different antibody tests out there. And the antibody test you get may be one that's designed to measure the antibodies you get from a natural infection, uh, which is not the same as the antibodies that you get from the from the shot. So you can be very much misled. There is no correlation between your commercial antibody test result and whether or not your vaccine took. So that's point number one. Don't go get the antibody test after your shot because it doesn't mean anything. Some people have managed to get through the line and get a third shot, um, even though we have a database that is tracking who's had their first and second doses. This has happened and it's a problem because that person getting their third shot is getting in front of the line of other people who haven't been able to get their shot yet. And it's also not sanctioned by the special emergency use authorization that we have from the FDA to use these vaccines. So if the vaccinator has been misled by a person who says, oh, this is my first shot or this is my second shot when it's really their third shot, that person that's asking for that is actually causing the person giving the vaccine to do something wrong that is outside of the emergency use authorization. We're not allowed to give a third vaccine and there's no evidence that it helps. Is there any evidence that there is harm? Because I would imagine a third hasn't been studied in these clinical trials. Right. There's no there's probably not harm and we don't have evidence of harm and it hasn't been studied. But there's harm on a societal level and on a community sure. level. Mm -hmm. It finds trust and it also gets in the way of people who need to get the vaccine getting their first dose. 
Have you heard about there? There's some people who are hypothesizing that the reaction you have after you get your shot is equal to the reaction you may have if you actually got the virus. Is there any truth to that? Really, no correlation, no data. I want to ask before we go, how are you feeling about our local numbers? We, of course, now have these briefings twice a week. We heard 249 cases uh, reported in our area. Give us your perspective. Right. So the community positivity rate is very low, and I'm quite encouraged by that. But as we've said all along, we mustn't let our guard down. So we have to get everybody that can get immunized, immunized before we start relaxing the measures. And we're here uh, coming up on Easter Sunday. Uh, lots of people will be going to their houses of worship and having family gatherings. And so, as always, I'd like to remind everyone that we're not out of the woods yet. So please continue to wear your mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance, even though it's Easter Sunday. Great advice. Dr. Ruth Bergeron with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Always appreciate your input on some of these viewer questions. Mm -hmm. We'll see you next you. week. We'll be right back. Today, jurors hearing from a woman who may have known George Floyd best on the fourth day of the Derek Chauvin murder trial. Floyd's girlfriend spoke about his opioid addiction. It's something that we, we, we dealt with every day. You know, you, it's not something that just kind of comes and goes. She explained Floyd's first introduction to painkillers was because of a neck and shoulder injury. Another witness, Maurice Hall, was supposed to testify today. He was in the vehicle with Floyd the day he died. Hall instead invoking his Fifth Amendment. We'll be right back. Well, as the saying goes, one man's trash is another man's treasure. McDonald's taking that literally, unveiling the first of many playgrounds in the United Kingdom made entirely from recycled Happy Meal toys. The company has collected more than one million used and unsold toys from the classic kids combo. There's Woody. They plan to build at least 14 more playgrounds using these plastic playthings. It's a lot of happiness from Happy Meals past. That's it's pretty good, cool. Yeah, a that's idea. a good idea, yeah. right? When you think of Egypt, snow, probably the last thing that comes to mind. But take a look at this. These are mountains, frosty looking peaks in the middle of the Sahara Desert. But it's not actually snow, though. It's salt. This is amazing to me. The phenomenon is caused by seawater collecting in pools and then evaporating in the sunlight. Adam? Yeah, that's how they make oh, salt. Okay. Water, right? <laughs> that's how you get salt. The salt left behind Harvest. could be mistaken for a winter resort. It is apparently perfect for sledding. Oh, that, of course, that gets a sweet. Yeah, he loves it. Yeah. yeah. It's meteorologically Goggles challenging. probably necessary. Time to pinch some pennies if you have any. Today is National One Cent Day. You can celebrate by donating to the Take a Penny, Leave a Penny tray at stores, playing penny slots, or buying some penny stocks. Honest Abe Lincoln, whose face has been on the coin since 1909, may not have liked sharing a holiday with April Fools. Yeah, but if you're in need of a prank idea, maybe make a small purchase entirely in pennies. Adam, penny for your thoughts. Maybe give us your two cents. You know, <laughs> I think a penny holiday really makes a lot of sense. I see what you did right there. See, there's always three. They come in threes. They do. Did you guys ever do that? Find a penny, pick it up all day long. You have good luck. Yeah. 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 Did you have to put it in your shoes, though? Yes. You did. OK. Yeah. Glad I'm not. I mean, or in I'm, your penny loafers. In the penny loafer. OK, well, I never had the penny loafers, but my tennis shoes. Yeah, they worked well. Yeah, you do have it, it, it doesn't count unless you put it in your shoe. Thank you. I am so glad I'm not alone in that. OK, there and have it, been many references out here where I am an island, <laughs> but, but not on this one. <laughs> I am on that island with you. All right. All right. We didn't have any April Fools there either. No, I'm not a big I'm not a big April Fools person. I'm more of the fools outside of April Fool's Day, oh, that and that's why people get revenge on me on today. On April Fool's. <laughs> you know how I like to hide around the corner when I hear the door open to the studio? I yep, ooh, sure jump out do. and scare people. Mm -hmm. right? Love you. Got to watch out for Justin Horn because he gets punchy and reflective. <laughs> yeah. That's his reflexes. He just gets punchy. <laughs> He's got the reach, too. He does. So yeah. I, I learned the hard way with him. <laughs> but David Hurtado. <sighs> oh, yeah. Got me good. Yeah. He's a little high strung. He anyway, gives a good so, yell. Yeah. When you scare him. It was the foot stomp. No, he got me. He was hiding around the corner as I was ready to shoot the promos. He's in oh. our promotions department. Oh, good. 
Nicely done, David. I'll give you every April 1st. That's it. Otherwise, it, it's just, thermometer Thursday today, right? Yeah, it is. Okay. I've got actually an update on something we talked about months ago. This is good. All right. Beautiful evening. Quiet outside right now. A little cool tomorrow morning and then some dampness as we go into the weekend. So let's get right to it and talk about temperatures. First of all, I want to get you prepared again for tomorrow morning in particular. Right now, beautiful. The whole state of Texas. Alpine 65, Abilene 68, along with Dallas, Austin 67. You get into Lubbock at 65. Has some lower 70s around here, even 75 at Catula and Del Rio. But very pleasant outside, low humidity, comfortable temperatures. I wish we could stretch this into the holiday weekend, but that's not going to be the case. Instead, some clouds will be teasing us. We'll get to that in a moment. Tomorrow morning, a bit of a chill in the air again. Mid 40s for most of us near 40 up in the hill country for lows. Kerrville about 41, Bernie, Lake Hills, Timberwood Park 41, even Seguin, Lavernia, Elmendorf, Von Army about 44 for your morning low temperatures. That's at sunrise Then we quickly warm up and we make it into the lower 70s. So it's going to look and feel a lot like what we had out there today with partly cloudy conditions and pleasant weather. Now the morning readings are going to be on the rise. They don't stay below average for very long this time of year. By Sunday, we'll be back up into the upper 50s, near 60 for those morning temperatures. And then once the humidity is back in place next week, morning temperatures are back into the 60s. Remember that humidity and high dew points have a big impact on morning low temperatures. Here's the weather pattern. East Coast, well, particularly New England, parts of the Great Lakes, widespread snow. That's they a lot of people would wish that was an April Fool's joke. It's not. That's actually happening out there. And we've got this little bit of moisture coming on shore from Las Vegas to Los Angeles toward Phoenix. That's our weekend system. A weak upper level disturbance going to be fairly disheveled in nature. It's going to drop in and stir things up a little bit, but not much. Mostly it's just going to tease us. Plenty of low cloud cover. This is Saturday 8 a.m. A few sprinkles here and there is all we're expecting throughout the day, midday on into the afternoon, five o'clock here, a few hit or miss sprinkles. That's it. And even into Saturday night and early on your Easter morning dampness in the form of drizzle and yes, more sprinkles, but it should only add up to a few hundredths of an inch here and there. And we could use the rain, obviously, especially here in South Texas. We are in an extreme drought farther south of town. So 46 in the morning, 72 tomorrow afternoon, southeasterly breeze at 5 to 15, low humidity and comfortable. We get into the weekend fairly gray. That disturbance will give us plenty of clouds, but they're mainly just going to tease us with a little bit of dampness periodically rather than any real good moisture and accumulation. Look at next week. Those temperatures back up near 90 by this time next week. Mm. OK, months back we talked about um, a woman by the name of Lydia Gonzalez who makes crosses out of clothespins. Do you remember that? Yes. She makes these crosses out of clothespins. She decorates them. You see this one has little fall festiveness to it. And it's beautiful. It, yeah, she'll color some of the other ones like this one. Well, she wondered, hey, maybe you could decorate one with dun, 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 homemade thermometer. Wow. And so it took a little work and modifications there, but um, I was able to do that. And I figured perfect timing right before Good Friday. We go into Easter and right. here you go. And I chose I want to get that pink one because it's kind of an Easter Eastery Easterish. I was thinking Easter that color. perfect Easter pink Easter pink. Yes, exactly. So Lydia, yes, because remember before I said if there's something you create that you'd like to you know, try to get a thermometer on or whatever, just, you know, drop me a line and might be able to make that happen. So it takes some time, but we were able to make that happen. Hey, we have a winner as well. Today's thermometer winner is Leonor Ramirez of San Antonio. You can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to the, enter the drawing. And that will be, of course, a traditional handmade homemade thermometer. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday. It's April 1st. They're still working to learn the name of a man killed while crossing a northeast side road last night. San Antonio police say the victim was crossing FM 78 near North Foster Road about 10 o'clock. He was hit by an SUV. Investigators say one driver swerved to avoid hitting the man. Another driver didn't have time to stop. 
The man died at the scene. No charges are pending. Meantime, the Bear County Medical Examiner identifying an 80 year old man killed in a crash yesterday evening. He is Antonio Arismendez Martinez. According to San Antonio police, his vehicle was T boned by a silver car near Covington and Rigsby yesterday at around 530. He died at the scene. It's about to be Easter weekend, and this morning a group of volunteers from New Star Energy came together for an opportunity to give back to migrant kids staying at the Freeman Coliseum Expo Hall. About 2,000 Easter gift bags were filled this morning with everything from Easter eggs and snacks to colored pencils, T-shirts, and ball caps. Well, now that President Biden has laid out his $2 trillion infrastructure plan, the next step is to sell it. The plan calls for rebuilding things like roads, bridges, improving public transportation, the use of electric vehicles, and exprod expanding broadband. The president says he'll look to key cabinet members to help push the plan forward, but members of both parties already expressing reservations. A nonprofit is helping to bring some joy to kids of all ages at Methodist Children's Hospital, dancing while cancering. Methodist Children's Hospital marks the organization's 20th partnership to gift children who are newly diagnosed with cancer. That's all our time. Thanks for watching. See you on the night beat at 10.